Vicky. Hi. Hi, I'm Jim Kelly. Welcome to Eckerd number 169. Nice to meet you, Mr. Kelly. Please, call me Jim. Jim it is. I'm sorry to get you here so early, but I wanted to go over a few things before we open the store. Oh, I don't mind at all. In fact, I'll feel more comfortable knowing the procedures and policies before I get started. I even brought my notepad. <laughs> Great. Actually, we're going to be going over a lot of things that I'm sure you already know. Things like keeping the store clean, keeping the shelves properly stocked, making sure the store is properly merchandised, basically procedures and management techniques that help us provide superior service and maintain a perfect-looking store. Do these expectations and standards come from the corporate office? Yes, good question. Since every Eckerd store has many similar problems, Eckerd created standard procedures and policies that help create a national image that is uniform and inviting to our customers. Makes sense. Let's get started. You already did. I did? Sure. When I walked up, you were looking at the storefront. There are five basic areas that we're going to review, and the storefront is one of them. Check the front windows. Right. Make sure that the banners are straight and in good condition. Replace the ones that are worn, sun-faded, or outdated. Are there guidelines to follow? For window banners, price items, and institutional signs, we follow the monthly desk calendar. For store entrance signage, we follow the guidelines in the merchandise and adjacency plan, like this mandatory signage. It has emergency numbers and store hours. It should always be displayed. Nothing about the storefront is happenstance. I guess planning an appealing storefront is half the battle won. Well, how we display our signage is very important, but it's also important to keep the immediate storefront and sidewalk clean. You know, free of trash, litter, gum, shopping carts. This sidewalk looks pretty good and clean, too. Do you have it pressure washed? Well, as a matter of fact, we do. We have it cleaned about once a year as necessary, with district operation manager's approval. It's also a good idea to check the parking area, just to make sure there are no unsightly problems. Should we also look after the trash receptacle? Yes. Generally, we make sure that it's located at the opposite end of the storefront and in good condition. And the same goes for the newsstands, if your store has one. Well, that's pretty much it for the storefront. It looks like you're on a pretty tight ship. Thank you. We try to make our storefront look appealing. But this is just the outside. There's a lot more to running a store when you get inside. I guess it takes a lot of hands to make it all run smoothly. <laughs> Once again, you beat me to the punch. I did. Sure. The next area we're going to discuss are all the people that make it work. That is, the customer service expectations for all Eckerd Associates. Let's go inside. Let's go. This is a good place to start. The register. Right. This is where much of our customer contact takes place for associates as well as management. We need to make sure that our customers leave with a good impression of our store. So they'll say to themselves, I'll be back. Exactly. Now, a lot of this stuff is common sense, but we want to make sure that our associates don't forget to smile, for example. Whenever possible, use the customer's last name. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Have a good day. How will they know the customer's name? Good question. Usually, I tell my associates to read checks, driver's license, and labels on prescriptions. Now, when there are three customers at the counter, or if there's a long transaction, the associate should call for assistance. And when calling, they should use the associate's first name. Nobody likes to be kept waiting. And that's part of the reason customers shop at Eckerd's. Now, everything isn't going to always run smoothly, but associates should always, always be courteous. Customer complaints should never be taken personally. And associates should be sure to acknowledge every customer. A smile or a simple hello will make all the difference. Are there procedures for when an associate assists a customer in the store? Like the 10-foot rule. You've done your homework. When an associate is within 10 feet of a customer, they should offer assistance. The associate should take the customer to the item they want. Pointing is unacceptable. What if the associate is busy straightening or stocking the shelves? Should they leave what they're doing? Absolutely. Customer assistance takes priority over any task. So I guess if we all remember to smile, be courteous, and think about what the customer would want, then the rest will just about fall into place. That's a good way to put it. Customer perception is everything. So even our attire is important. Is the company policy very strict? Yes. The career apparel policy is outlined in the Policies and Procedures Manual. In fact, we have a poster in the break room that displays our uniforms. It gives our associates some guidelines to follow. I've seen it. It's very helpful. So what if someone shows up in a plaid shirt and cutoffs? <laughs> well, that hasn't happened yet, but we definitely send them home to change. A uniform look is very important. And everyone has and is wearing a name badge. And we keep extras in the office. 
So really, you just want everybody to follow the corporate career apparel policy and keep a neat and clean appearance. Neat, clean, and uniform. That's a good way to put it, which brings us up to our next subject. Cleanliness? Cleanliness and housekeeping. Let's start in the break room. Housekeeping involves every section of the store, including the break room. It means keeping things clean and organized as well as up to date. For example, this bulletin board must have all current human resource policies and state required posters. Do you go over these bulletins with the associates? Absolutely. We make sure the associates are aware of the bulletins and we keep them informed. We usually do this at our monthly meetings. We also explain the locker program in great detail. Did you do this at the store you trained in? Absolutely. We followed the procedures as outlined by loss prevention, and we completed the Shrink Buster program daily and initialed the loss prevention calendar. That's the way we work. We also make sure our associates follow the blue-orange sticker policy for purchased items. Now, while we're back here, we should discuss our restrooms. All right. Believe it or not, housekeeping for our restrooms is just as important as any other part of the store. I agree. How we keep our restrooms is a reflection on the rest of the store. That's exactly right. Our restrooms are stocked and cleaned daily. We maintain a log checklist as per company policy, and we orange sticker our supplies as per Eckerd loss prevention policy. Let's go in the store and walk around, and I'll point out some important housekeeping tips. Okay. One thing to remember is to periodically check the air conditioning vents to make sure that they are clean. We also check our fixtures to make sure that they are lighting properly. And we follow the routine to keep the entire store looking Eckerd perfect. You mean daily straightening? Well, that's just part of it. The daily maintenance routine begins at the same time every evening, with straightening and fronting of all merchandise. It also includes checking the signage within the store, straightening the card nest area, sweeping the entire store, and cleaning all windows and glass areas. With Eckerd glass cleaner, of course. Of course. <laughs> the routine means making the store spotless and ready for opening the following day. Now, it's much more involved than the brief explanation I've just given you, but you get the general idea. Does the routine include mopping the floors? Yes, we spot mop as necessary, especially if there are spills. But that's more of a safety issue than anything else. Do you assign an associate to work the coolers? Yes, I almost forgot. In fact, let's walk up that way. Every day, we assign a CDP to work the coolers. Did you say CDP? Oh, yeah. That stands for Cooler Display Personnel. So they're in charge of filling and straightening the coolers, cleaning the doors, straightening the sides, and checking for outdated products. Exactly. Now, that's just about it for housekeeping, except for the register and the stock room, which we'll get to in a little while, and the office. Now, the office should be planogrammed according to Eckert Asset Protection Policy. We keep it neat and clean at all times, and we keep management phone numbers and photographs on display. Oh, by the way, I brought my photograph with me so the customers will know who I am. Good. We'll be sure to hang that up later. Let's see. We have time for a couple of more areas. Let's just step around the corner and talk about merchandising. Merchandising is a combination of both marketing and advertising. It includes both positioning of the product as well as product signage. Take this ad board, for example. We must make sure that we have enough rebate pads and current ads for our customers to take. End caps, however, are a little more involved. We need to make sure that the end caps are stocked, neat, and that the signage is correct. The same goes for a bulk end, like this one, that reflects only one price. What about multi-product end caps? On end stands with items reflecting two different prices, the items on the top two or three shelves will be represented by the blue sign holder at the top. Now, this seems like a lot for you to remember. The guidelines in the map help out a lot. Any questions so far? Aren't some signs pre-printed and sent from corporate? Yes, electronics. The power sign should be placed in plexiglass holders, and all electronics should be wired with anti-theft devices. Any questions so far? Well, yeah. I notice the signs on the ledge are pre-printed as well. Are there specific rules for that signage? Yes. You've got a good eye for detail. Let's go over there and take a look at the ledge. Those blue sign holders should be placed every four to six feet. Of course, the items should be faced properly, and we follow the ledge planogram. 
It still amazes me that with over 18,000 items, the store is so well organized. That's where our planograms come in. If we move up the aisle, I'll show you what I mean. Planograms from corporate help us maintain a very complex display like this. Not only do they show us how to display the item, but they also explain things like clip strips. Clip strips are based on split class. They should be kept full and placed four to six feet from each other. Planograms also include information on labeling, signing, and side racks. I notice over here that you've substituted a product of equal value for the item that's out of stock. Is there more to it? Yes. The substitution item must be sale price. And if you're using a scanner, you'll have to change the price using the symbol unit. Now, the scan policy is, if the Eckerd label isn't out front, it must be priced and in most cases signed. Will every store be scanning this year? Well, that's the plan, but there are still rules that apply for non-scanning items. Markdowns, for example, will have to be priced using the red sticker like this one. Date codes must be used for each markdown, and you must remember to pull the barcodes each time to avoid reordering. Mm -hmm. Now, we try to maintain a no-outs policy, but sometimes that's unavoidable. We want to be in stock, but not out of stock. Inventory control is a very important part of merchandising. I guess that's where the OPOQ order guideline comes in. Right. If an item is a fast mover, we can change the order point using company guidelines. But that's something we just need to continually watch. This rebate sign over here is pre-printed and sent to us from the vendor. You must remember to display it properly and make sure that it is up to date. And that goes for the products themselves, too. The older items must be moved up front, and you must take the expired items off the shelf, especially for food items, eye preps, vitamins, pet foods, and things of that nature. That's a lot to remember. You'll catch on. Besides, I'll be here to remind you. Good. Our planograms help us tremendously. It's really impossible to remember every single detail, especially when things are constantly changing. Wire racks are a good example, and there are some in the power aisle. For wire side racks, we get monthly planograms and pre-printed signs. Are some of these for clearance and overstock items? Yes, and they should always be full. When they empty halfway, we restock them with something else. Mm -hmm. Now, we're almost through with merchandising. There's just a few things I want to show you. Let's head toward the pharmacy. The impulse section. Right. There's one by every register. They are a very important sales area. So we must make sure that the merchandise is stocked and straightened. And as with other areas, there's a planogram to follow. We also get productive sales from clearance merchandise, like on the end cap over here. Now, the first, second, and third markdown is issued from corporate. Any other markdown must be approved by the DOM. Is clearance merchandise usually moved from its home location? Only after the first markdown. Then it's moved to the clearance end cap. You must remember that merchandising is a combination of both marketing and advertising. We are constantly changing our merchandising tactics to keep up with both consumer and store demands. Well, is that it for the tour? Pretty much so. There's just one more area we need to cover. The only thing left is the stock room. And that's exactly where we're going. Room. Pretty exciting stuff. You said it. By now you know that organizing and maintaining our stores takes planning. Well, it's just as important to have an organized stock room, and that takes a little planning too. Now, every store has a supply section, and this is ours. And this is planogrammed as well? It's under asset protection in the SOP manual. Every section is labeled. Any merchandise taken from stock and used must be charged to store supplies, and you must always fill out a store use expense form. The tools, the pads, the pricing guns, everything you need to operate the store is kept here. What about fixtures and shelves? We keep those in a designated area up there. The shelves that we don't need, we usually just send back to the warehouse. In this area, we keep all our damaged and defective merchandise. All the shelves, as well as the boxes, must be clearly labeled. Is everything to be listed on the clipboard? Yes, we return these items once a week. Non-returnable items we sell at 75% off retail, and we are responsible for having the vendors write up credits. All the bins are labeled, OTC, diapers, and so on. The cases should be flush and facing front, and all boxes with case good labels should be facing forward if possible. And up here is where we keep our seasonal items. Is that to keep them out of the way? That's exactly right, and they're labeled Christmas, Easter, Halloween, and so on. And this is our DSD area. 
It is a six-foot section for loose piece items. It must be clearly accessible. And as you know, no loose piece item except for seasonal carryover is ever to be boxed up. What's that up there? That's our INSCO and tape storage. There's one box for each month. It's where we store our checkout and detail tapes, and we rotate those on a yearly basis. And over here is our loose piece goods in back stock. Yes, I saw it when we walked in. As part of our daily routine, we are required to work out the products in this area every day, and we must write a fill slip on each back stock category. And what else? Totes. Totes, thank you. Totes we stack near the rear door. We try to keep them out of the way. And on the day the truck arrives, we move them outside. And as you know, we never store anything in empty totes. And finally, this back area needs to be kept clean. We need to make sure that the dumpster doesn't get over full. Since we take out the trash and empty the garbage every night, it can fill up pretty fast. So we make sure to check it daily. Jim, you're a pretty good tour guide. Thanks. I've had a lot of practice. The main thing to remember about the stock room is that it's a staging area where products come in and are worked onto the sales floor as soon as possible. There's no cash register in the stock room. <laughs> Very good point. Everything we've discussed, the storefront, merchandising, personnel, housekeeping in the stock room, must be maintained according to Eckert policy. And the reason is simple. We want to provide a superior shopping experience for our customers. We want them to come back. And those procedures are designed to make those cash registers ring. <laughs> well, any questions? Hi, I'm Bob Bowes. You are about to participate in the initial training program of the new Eckerd Drug Floor Care Program. I stress that word new since this program will introduce our new approach to floor care in all of our stores. We have been evaluating this new floor care program for the past 18 months and we feel that it will bring many benefits to our company. First, this program will ensure that we have a consistent appearance throughout our chain. We will all be doing the same floor care procedures and using the same high quality floor care products from the SC Johnson Wax Company. Second, this corporate wide approach to floor care will deliver better control of our maintenance budgets. This will lead to better bottom lines in all of our stores. Finally, this new program will help to reduce our exposure to customer slip and fall claims and litigation. Johnson Wax will partner with Eckerd to defend these situations through their expert witness program. As you can see, there are many benefits to this new approach to floor care at Eckert. We have all the pieces in place now to ensure the success of this initiative, but the most important part remains you. We need each of you to participate and commit to our Eckert floor care program. Together we can improve our appearance, lower our cost, and make our stores an attractive and safe shopping environment for our customers. Thanks, and good luck with the new Eckert floor care program. Thanks, Bob. Hi, I'm Bert Carrier, National Account Manager for SC Johnson Wax. You're about to see something that's brand new for Ecker Drugs, and that's the new Ecker Drug Floor Care Program. For the first time in the history of Ecker Drugs, you're going to be a part of a comprehensive floor care program, one that's designed to offer you three important things. One, the first thing is consistency of appearance, no matter where the Ecker Drug Store is located. All of the stores will be doing the same procedures and will have the same procedures followed by the building service contractors when they come in to do their work. The second thing that it will offer to you is control of your maintenance budget. For the first time, you'll be able to know exactly how much money you're spending on your budget. You'll know what the money is being spent for, and you will also see the results that you're getting for those dollars that you spend. Ultimately, it's going to save you money and make your bottom line look better. And third, and probably the most important thing, it's going to give you security in the fact that with this program, your risk management and your liability window for slip falls will be greatly reduced because you will have a program that's been proven nationwide in retailers across the country. It's a great program and in partnership between Eckerd Drugs and SC Johnson Wax, it's going to be a program that's going to make your stores the best that they can possibly be and offer your customers a wonderful shopping experience. 
It's going to be in two parts. The daily procedures for the in-store personnel, and second part will be the procedures that all contractors will be expected to adhere to every time they come in your store. So it's a great program. Why don't we get started now? And let's take a look at what your responsibilities will be on a daily basis to make this the best program that Eckerd Floors could ever have. Hi, Jim. Hi, Bart. I'd like to introduce Jim Allred, the assistant manager at Store 582 in Jackson, Mississippi. Jim, I know you've had an opportunity to preview the new Eckerd Floor Care program, and after seeing it, what do you think about it? I like it. I think it's a good program. I'm fixing to do the first step of the program, which is the store survey. Store survey? Now, wait a minute. Why is that the first part of your program? Well, I want to survey my floors and see what I'm up against, so that when I go to the back room to get my tools, I get the right ones to do the job right. You know, that's a key point. When you do any floor care program, the first part of a good program is the survey. If you don't take a few minutes, walk around the store and just check to see which types of problems you might run into, you're going to constantly be going back and forth, back and forth to the back room, trying to find the tools that you'll need to do the job right. So the survey is an important part of the program, and it's the first step in the new Eckerd floor care program. Tell you what, Jim, I'll go with you to finish the survey, and then I'll help you gather the tools in the back room. Okay. Good. Well, Jim, now that we've finished the survey of the floor and we've gathered together all of the uh, equipment that we will need to do tonight's work, uh, let's take a minute and share with everybody the tools that we found that we're going to need tonight. First of all, we're going to need a gum scraper or putty knife because we did have gummed labels and some chewing gum and some other unidentified things on the sales floor, but we'll use those to get that up tonight. The next thing we're going to use is our dust mop, and well, as you can see, we've decided that this dust mop's just not going to work out tonight because of the amount of dirt that's already in it. So we're going to go to our clean dust mop tonight. While we're talking about dust mops, let me bring home one point to you. When you receive a dust mop that's wrapped in plastic, you need to take it out of the plastic, clip it onto a handle, and stand it in a corner and let it sit there overnight. When these come from the manufacturer, they have so much oil on those fibers that if you take it straight out of the plastic and put it onto the floor, you run the risk of leaving behind an oil film that could become slippery and it will definitely harm your floor finish. It will dull the shine off the floor and it'll make the floor harder to clean because it'll hold dirt actually into the floor. So always take your dust mops out of the wrapper, stand them in the corner and let them sit for at least overnight, 24 hours better, and you'll get the results that you need out of a dust mop. Another thing that we found we're going to need tonight is our kitchen broom. Now, well, the reason for the kitchen broom is you just can't get around the checkout stands, around the displays, and up against the edges using just a dust mop. This will be used to pull all of those things out into an aisle, and then we'll use the dust mop to take everything from the aisles and bring it to the back room and off the sales floor. The next thing that we're going to need is our clean mop bucket. Now, you may notice that we've lined this mop bucket with a trash can liner, and there's a very good reason why we do that. With a mop bucket such as this being plastic, it has a tendency to hold chemicals into it after you've used it a while. The problem is, if you've used different chemicals, the one that you had in there yesterday may have an effect on the one you have in there today, and that too could harm your floors. So you want to put a trash can liner in, that way you know that the product that you're putting in, the fresh chemical solution, will not be impregnated with anything that comes from the bucket and it won't be contaminated to the point that it'll harm your floor finish. You'll also see that Jim's already cleaned his ringer and that's a good idea to do as well. You know, the, the other thing that he has is a good clean mop. He's already washed it out. He's uh, allowing it to, to drain a little bit right now so that it's ready to use when he goes out on the sales floor. And then the final thing that Jim wants to do is he's already added four gallons of water into his mop bucket. And now it's time to put the, uh, the active ingredient that will make that mop water do what it's supposed to do. And that's the Johnson's Accumix UHS Cleaner. Now this product comes in a very unique bottle. And as you'll see as Jim shows us, all you do is squeeze the bottle and it will fill the cylinder on top up with one ounce of the Johnson Cleaner. Now for the four gallons of water that we have in the mop bucket, this is all that you will need in order to do a thorough job of cleaning the floor. As Jim will show us, it's very easy to pour, and that's all that will pour out of the container at one time is that one ounce that's in the top of the bottle. So it makes measuring very, very easy, and it eliminates the risk of overusing the chemical and damaging your floors once again. 
You know, if you have any questions about the procedures as to what you should or shouldn't do, as Jim has shown, we have posted in the back room the Eckerd floor care wall chart. Now, this outlines every step that Jim's going to go through tonight as he does the daily procedures. And it also outlines what the contractors will be doing when they come into your store, too. So if you have a question or if you're in doubt about a certain procedure, refer to your Eckerd Showplace floor care system wall chart. And if you need to get a little further in-depth detail, then refer to your Eckerd floor care manual. This has all of the details that you will need step-by-step, in-depth, and will show you how to have the best-looking floors around. Well, we've got everything we're going to need now, Jim, to do our job for tonight, so we will take this out to the floor. But before we do, there's one other thing that I want to mention to you. During the day, during the sales day, in the event that you should have a slippery situation where someone spills something on your floor and you have to go out and clean it up, always post the wet floor caution signs. This is one of the most important tools that you will have in your store. When you do that, you're warning the customer that there could be a slippery situation, and you're also protecting yourself from liability with slips and falls. You should never mop a floor during the business day without first posting the wet floor caution signs. It's also a good idea if you've got a real rainy day, place these next to the front entrance so that you're warning people ahead of time that there could be that possibility of a slippery situation. We hope not, but you never can tell, and by posting this, you're helping to protect Eckerd's, and you're helping to protect your store, and most important of all, you're helping to protect your customers as well. Okay, Jim, I guess we're ready now to get started, so why don't we go on out onto the floor and start the nightly procedures? Okay. Now that Jim has gathered all of the necessary tools in order to do a professional job, he starts on the sales floor by beginning with the sweeping using the kitchen broom. Jim uses the broom to sweep out around the edges, by the displays, and underneath the checkout stands. He also carries a putty knife in order to remove gummed labels, chewing gum, or any other object that's stuck to the floor. The putty knife or gum scraper can also be used for removing buildups around the edges. It's important that Jim pulls everything out to the center of the floor before beginning the dust mopping operation. By using the kitchen broom to pull the dust and debris out to the center of the aisle, it makes the dust mopping operation simple and quick. Once Jim has completed dust mopping the entire sales floor, he'll then be ready to do the damp mopping operation using the Johnson Wax Accumix UHS Cleaner. The next step in the Eckerd Drug Floor Care Program's daily procedures is the damp mopping operation. Jim took special care to ensure that he removed as much dirt and debris as he possibly could during the sweeping and dust mopping operations. And now for that final cleanup, he will use a fresh solution of Johnson's Accumix UHS Cleaner Jim makes sure that he works along the edges and covers the entire sales floor. During the time of the damp mopping operation, should the mop water become dirty, that, is, that will be the point in time to change the mop water and the solution. The longer you work with a fresh solution and clean equipment, the better your floor will look. Well, there you have it. Those are the new Eckerd Floor Care Program in-house procedures. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, boy, that's going to take a lot of effort to do that. But I guarantee you one thing. If you do take the time and you do the job right, you will have the best-looking stores around. And that's the purpose of this whole program. You know, it's been proven time and time again by every magazine in the United States that deals with the retail trade that the number one priority of a customer as to what they look for when they choose a store to shop in, it's appearance. How clean is the store? How well stocked is it? And overall, how good does it look? The purpose of this new program is to ensure that every Eckerd store, no matter where it's located, has the best looking floors and the best looking stores around. If you will take the time and do the job right, I guarantee you that your stores will stand tall. And when they do that, you'll have more customers, you'll have more profits, and you'll have a better bottom line. You're going to be happy, the company's going to be happy, and most important of all, the customer is going to be happy. 
You know, there's another part to this program, and that involves the building service contractors. We're going to take a look now, and you're going to see firsthand which procedures that they are expected to perform every time they come into your store. It's an interesting program for them, and it's an interesting program for you. But together, working together, we can have the best floor care program in the United States. I honestly believe that, and I guarantee you, you'll find those results as part of the new Eckerd floor care program. The second part of the new Eckerd floor care program involves the building service contractors. They play a vital role in the success of this program. On each and every service, the contractor should first check in at the front service desk with the manager and sign the vendor sign-in sheet. Floors took a little bit of a beating. It's at this point in time that the manager will inform the contractor of any special needs that they have noticed. And it's also a good idea at this point in time for the manager and the contractor to walk the entire sales floor to ensure that any particular problem areas can be dealt with on that night's service. Another area the contractor has responsibility for cleaning is the pharmacy. However, this requires special procedures since the law does not allow anyone to enter the pharmacy area without a registered pharmacist being on duty and present during the entire cleaning operation. This is not only done for the protection of Eckerd drugs and their security, it is also for the security of the contractor and their employees. It's important at this point in time that the contractor thoroughly sweeps removes all debris from the pharmacy area, and then thoroughly damp mops the floor with the properly diluted chemicals. One of the last duties the contractor will perform while cleaning the pharmacy area is the collection and removal of all trash. Excuse me, one last thing. I'll need to check that before you leave. All righty. However, it is company policy that nothing will be removed from the pharmacy area without first being inspected by the pharmacist. Once the trash has been collected, the contractor will put a fresh, clean can liner into the garbage receptacle and then replace it into its proper position. Thank you very much, Kim. We'll see you next time. Have a good evening. All right. Once the initial walkthrough has been completed, the contractor then begins the procedures as outlined in the Eckerd Floor Care Manual. The contractor, as with any good program, begins by surveying the floor, then using the kitchen broom removes all litter and debris from the edges of the shelving, beneath the displays, and around the checkout stands. The contractor also uses a putty knife or a gum scraper to remove gummed labels, chewing gum, or any other substance from the floor. The putty knife can also be used to remove buildups along the edges. It's critical that the contractor do a thorough job of removing all litter and debris from the areas that cannot be reached by dust mopping. After pulling everything out into the center of the aisle, the contractor then uses a clean dust mop to remove all the litter and debris to the back room of the sales floor. Once this job has been completed, the contractor is then ready to move on to the auto scrubbing operation. Once the contractor has thoroughly and completely swept, dust mopped, and used the putty knife to remove all gummed labels and any other foreign substances from the floor, they are then ready to use the automatic scrubber to do the deep cleaning procedure. It's very important that the contractor use the Johnson Wax Ultra High Speed Cleaner, properly diluted one cap full for each eight gallons of cool water in the solution tank of the auto scrubber. However, there are places within the store that the contractor will not be able to use the automatic scrubber. It's important that the contractor use the Johnson Wax Cleaner mixed one cap full for each two gallons of cool tap water in the mop bucket in order to clean around the gondolas, also around the cash registers, and around displays that cannot be removed. It's important that they also trail mop behind the automatic scrubber to ensure that any wet areas are thoroughly picked up prior to leaving a particular aisle. Now that the contractor has completely cleaned and scrubbed the floor, it's time to add that final finishing touch, burnishing or buffing of the floor. 
The new Eckerd Floor Care program includes Johnson Wax Trailblazer, a floor maintainer. This product is specially formulated with polymers and cleaners to enhance the shine and increase the longevity of the floor finish. There are a few things that the contractor needs to be careful of when doing any furnishing or buffing operation. One, they need to make sure that their equipment is in proper operating condition and that they are equipped with clean pads. It's also important to note that when using ultra high speed equipment, it should never be allowed to run in place because this will cause severe damage to the floor tiles. It's also important that the contractor operating the equipment be certified and understand how to use the equipment in order to achieve the maximum results. Now that the contractor has completed all of the floor care procedures as outlined in the new Eckerd floor care manual, the final step will be a walkthrough of the store with the store manager. It's at this point in time that the contractor will point out to the manager any potential problems that should be developing and what the proper procedures will be in order to prevent those from becoming major problems. It's also at this point in time that the manager will point out to the contractor any areas that he or she would like to see taken care of in the next and upcoming services. At this point in the procedure, the contractor will provide to the manager of the store a form outlining the Johnson Wax products which will be needed for the subsequent services to come. Well, there you have it. That's the new Eckerd Floor Care Program. As you can see, it's a very comprehensive program, but we know that when it's followed, it will provide consistent appearance throughout the chain. Not only that, it will also provide for you control of your maintenance budget dollars, and it will provide the cleanest, nicest looking shopping environment for the customer. I'd like to introduce to you right now Dave Settle, who's the district manager for the state of Mississippi, and also George Cobb, who's the store manager for Store 582 in Jackson. Dave, now that you've seen the program and been involved with it, what are your impressions? What do you think about it? I think it's a great program. It creates an Eckerd show place. Uh, it's total involvement from the corporate office down to the associates in the field, and particularly with store managers like George Cobb. There you hear it. These are the people that have been involved with the program, and they're sold on it. And I know that once you get involved, you too will be sold on the new Eckerd Floor Care program. There's one other person that we haven't heard from yet who has a real interest in this program and has been involved with it since day one. That's Ray Morgan. Why don't we hear from Ray now? Thanks, Bert. What you've seen today actually began over a year ago in Orlando, Florida, with five store managers and a district manager. And we were looking for what do you need from a good floor care program. And every one of them said, we need training. We need help. We need to know what to do in our stores, how to do it, when we should do it. They said a nice training manual would help. Maybe a wall chart with some step-by-step -step daily procedures. And even more important, a training film that will help us in dealing with the contractors and with our own associates. So what you've seen today, I think, covered all of those areas. But more important, what I've seen today is a team being born. We're working together with Johnson's Wax, with the corporate office, with all the store personnel, and I think what we have now is a program that's going to give us the consistency we need. Every store from Texas to New Jersey is going to be doing the same program. The main difference is going to be you, and that's where I think Eckerd's will always succeed is with their employees. So we're looking forward to a good year, and good luck to all of you.
Well, those of you who have been with us before know what to expect. But for our new viewers, let's take a moment to explain our show, Satisfaction Guaranteed. We have two challenges, one for each of today's contestants, and they'll be judged on how well they use the six important points in handling customer complaints. Those all-important six points are, one, listen to the customer and make eye contact. Two, get all the details of the complaint and repeat the facts back to the customer. Three, respond with genuine concern. Four, Tell the customer what can be done about the complaint. Five, call the store manager or the pharmacist if the situation requires it. And finally, six, thank the customer for allowing Eckert to satisfy her or his needs. Why is it so important that Eckert Associates try their hardest to satisfy customers? Because the majority of dissatisfied customers don't bother to complain to the store, and nine out of ten will never shop us again. But they will tell ten other people about their unpleasant shopping experiences. Well, I see our announcers ready to begin the contest, so let's go to the action in the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be a two-round contest with each contestant having one round to handle a complaint. The judges will use the 10-point scoring system, and their decision is final. In round one, from Atlanta, Georgia, representing the cosmetic department of every Eckerd drugstore, Miss Karen Lawrence. And her customer today is, also from Atlanta, Miss Ellen Cooper. That's Mrs. Ellen Cooper. Excuse me, Mrs. Ellen Cooper. All right, you all have your instructions? You know how to play? Do you have any questions? No. Good. Oh, miss. Miss. Yes. How may I help you today? Uh, I'm looking for that Revlon Flex shampoo you have advertised on sale for $1.79. I saw the sales sign, but there is no Revlon shampoo on the shelf. I can't believe that you're out of stock. Oh, I can understand why you're upset. Here you are looking for some special sale merchandise, and we seem to be out of it. Well, of course, it isn't exactly the end of the world, but I was looking forward to saving a little money on a favorite product. Are you sure there isn't any in the back room? No, I'm sure we put it all on the shelf last night. We must have sold it all. Some sale. I'm sorry, we're out. May I suggest this balsam and protein shampoo? It's an Eckerd brand that we promise will give you the same performance as Revlon Flex, and it costs less, even less than the special sale price on Revlon. No, no, I don't think so. I like my brand. I can give you a comparable national brand at significant savings. No, I don't want to try anything different. My hair is very sensitive. Never mind. Would it help if I get you a rain check? We're getting a delivery in tomorrow, and I could hold a bottle for you and give you a call. Okay, that'll be fine. But I still think you should have plenty of the product on hand when you advertise a sale. You're right, and thank you for letting us work this out. You're welcome. <laughs> it's the first time I ever got a thank you for complaining. An astonishing performance by this young lady from Atlanta. Let's see how the judges scored it. The score for listening, nine, nine, eight. Looks like judge number three picked up on something here. Let's take a look. Karen Lawrence was just a little slow in making eye contact with Mrs. Cooper, and she didn't smile very much. That must have been what the judge caught. Here comes the scores for getting all the details and repeating them back to the customer. Nine, nine, nine. Pretty good. And now responding with genuine concern. And the judge's score, nine. 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 I agree that Karen Lawrence let the customer know she was concerned. Nice job. But her score for telling Mrs. Cooper what Eckerd can do for her should be just super. Nine. Nine. Ten. That's going to be very hard to beat. Karen didn't give up until the customer was satisfied, and she didn't need to call the store manager. So we'll move on to our last category, thanking the customer. Nines across the board. By my calculations, Karen Lawrence's overall score came to an unofficial nine. We might have an award winner here. Let's see how our second matchup goes. Ladies and gentlemen, from Dallas, Texas, 
representing Eckert Front End Associates, Mr. Charles Adams. And here as his customer today, from Conroe, Mr. Buddy Barker. Gentlemen, you know the rules. Are there any questions? No? Good. Good morning, sir. How may I help you? Price on these batteries is wrong. Should be two forty-nine. Were there other packages over there with a different price? Nope. No, they all said two seventy-nine. But Wally's Drug World has a sale on these same batteries at two forty-nine. Now, don't you folks promise to meet all advertised prices on the same merchandise? Yes, we sure do. But all you need to get that price is a copy of Wally's ad. Well, I don't have a copy of Wally's ad. Now, you going to sell me these batteries at Wally's sale price or not? Sir, let me make sure I understand. You want these batteries at $249 because that's Wally's sale price, but you don't have a copy of Wally's ad. Yeah, right. Okay, this is a situation I haven't handled before. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Maybe I should call my store manager and hopefully he can help. I don't care if you got to call the president. I'll wait. The manager's right over there. Mr. Alleman. Hi. Howdy. How may I help you, Charles? Mr. Alleman, this gentleman saw an ad at Wally's showing these batteries at $249. He wants us to meet that price according to our policy, but he doesn't have a copy of Wally's ad. I'm sure we've got a solution for that, sir. Eckert tries to stay competitive with all our prices. How would you like to have batteries of the same high quality for $1.99? $1.99 for the same batteries? Well, not exactly the same. Well... Eckerd brand batteries, Whoa. designed to provide the same high-quality performance as the ones you wanted and at a lot lower cost. Well, what if I don't like them? If you don't like the batteries, you just bring them back. We'll refund your money or we'll give you a package of the nationally advertised brand. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a chance. Thanks for giving us the chance to make things right, instead of walking away mad. Yeah, I'll tell you, the kid was pretty good here. I think I threw him a curve. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the compliment. Well, there you have it. Young Charles Adams from Dallas, Texas, has just worked his way through a difficult situation. And I think the lad acquitted himself with style and grace. Now the judges have finished their deliberations. It's time to see how Adams did. Let's go to the judges' scorecards and see what they gave him for listening skills. Oh, it's a perfect clean sweep. Nines all the way across the board. And I'm not surprised because Adams' eyes were riveted on Mr. Barker from the beginning. Let's see how he did in getting all of the details. It's another set of good marks. All nines. Adams is on his way to a record if he can keep up this pace. Let's see how he did in the category of responding with genuine concern. Seven. Seven. Six. Not as high as the others. Let's look at the replay. Well, he wasn't rude, but he's never been in that situation before and didn't know what to do. He did follow the correct procedure when he called the manager. Let's see his scores. Nine. Eight. Eight. Pretty good. Now we're waiting for the marks for thanking the customer. And the judges seem to be sending a message to us. That's right. It was the store manager who did the thanking. But Adams thanked Barker for paying him a compliment. So this category won't count on the official scoring. The official tally is 8.3 for Charles Adams against Karen Lawrence's nine. Sometimes it's difficult and frustrating to meet a customer's needs. But when things get a little confusing, it's important to remember the six rules for keeping a customer satisfied. Let's see what our contestants have learned. First, always listen carefully. Smile and make eye contact with your customer. People like to know that you're tuned in. The second rule is to repeat the details of the complaint back to the customer after they have finished. That seems to work well. When customers hear you repeat their concerns in your own words, it makes it feel like you really understand the situation. Third, respond with genuine concern. Your customer may mention out-of-stock shampoo or batteries not on sale, but you can be sure that there are feelings involved. Disappointment, frustration, and often a touch of anger. Your concern helps to diffuse those feelings. Fourth, tell the customer what you can do. Nine times out of ten, you can find a way to satisfy the customer. That's why we have guarantees of service. Rule number five, 
Call the store manager or pharmacist if you don't know what to do, or if the situation looks like it might get out of hand. Store managers and pharmacists may have more experience in dealing with customers. And finally, thank the customer for allowing you to straighten things out. A customer who goes away angry can tell a lot of people about his or her bad experience. But a satisfied customer will talk to friends and family about the whole incident and will help Eka Drug win new customers. And that wraps it up for now. Today's top scorer was Karen Lawrence with Charles Adams running a very close second. This is Howard Cancel reminding every Eckerd Drugstore associate to stay alert for opportunities to satisfy our customers and to follow the six steps for keeping our customers satisfied. We leave you today with a reminder about the tools you can use to keep customers satisfied. Our Eckerd guarantees of service. Take all but these. Okay, great. Will that be all for you today? I think so. Fine, fine. Thanks, and have a nice day. Can I help you, gentlemen? Al Harris? That's right. I'm Lieutenant Skip Tracer. This is my partner, Nick Dixon. Record photocops. Can I see some identification? This is me. And uh, this is me. And this is me at our beach place last summer. Oh, oh, yeah. oh look at this. This is me. My wife, Doris. Hey. And this is me with his wife, Doris. Geez, you guys really are Eckerd photocopped. Well, what are you doing here? I'm afraid we're going to have to take you in, Al. On what charge? Failure you to see the total picture. Take his print, Skip. Right. His fingerprint, Skip. Right. Okay, they got him. Look, nothing like this has ever happened to me before. Can we kind of keep this low key? Surely we don't need the sirens. Yes, we do, and don't call me Shirley. Right. What happens now? You sign a confession. But what did I do wrong? I was neat, courteous, efficient. Yeah, how about thorough? Did you offer your customer two rolls of film for the price of one? Huh? Where do I sign? <laughs> Rats. Here, try mine. Cross? No, I'm in a good mood, actually. I won't have to go on trial or anything, will I? You? Go on trial? No way! <laughs> Order in the court! Order in the court! Order in the court! Mr. Fenstermacher, do you wish to continue questioning the defendant? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Very well, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Al Harris, last May 3rd, you made a phone call to a Miss Elsa Brown. Do you remember? <laughs> Yeah. No. I don't know. Well, then let me refresh your memory for you. It just so happens that conversation was videotaped by Lieutenant Tracer and Detective Dixon. What do you launch, babe? Your Honor, the prosecution kindly directs your attention. Mrs. Brown? L. Harris from Eckerd Photo Processing calling. Just want to let you know your prints are ready to be picked up. Oh, yes, ma'am. This afternoon will be fine. Well, I made the call, didn't I? Aha! But did you offer her two rolls of film for the price of one? Surely, Your Honor, it's enough just to make the call. No, it's not. And don't call me Shirley. 
Proceed, Mr. Fenstermarker. Gladly, Your Honor. The prosecution would like to introduce Exhibit B. These turned out nice. They sure did. By the way, will you be needing any film today? Uh, no thanks. Not today. Okay, great. Well, Mr. Harris, but, 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 but I, I asked him if you wanted film, right? But did you try to make an additional sale by suggesting Eckerd Special Processing Services? We have brochures on those on the photo kiosk. I, I figure if people want to know about them, they'll read about it for themselves. Fortunately, Mr. Harris, not everyone feels the same way. How do they look? Fine. These are my grandkids. <laughs> are they cute or what? You know, that shot would make a great enlargement, or even a poster print. We also have photo stickers, like these. They're real popular items. Oh, and if you'd like to share some shots with the family, we've got something called the Big Picture Package. Let me show you some of the sizes. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is the way it's done. Order in the court. Does the prosecution rest its case yet, Mr. Fenstermacher? In a moment, Your Honor. First, I'd like to show the defendant caught in a blatant act of indecent exposures. I was young, naive. I, I didn't know what I was doing. Surely, Your Honor. I'm warning you, Mr. Harris. And as for you, Mr. Fenstermacher, explain yourself. Your Honor, Exhibit C. Hi, I'd like a roll of Kodak 200 film, please. Sure, 24 or 36 exposures. No, 12 would be just fine. But they say the higher exposures are a better deal. Maybe, but I'll stick with the 12. Okay. I object. I object! Yes, Mr. Harris? I do try to sell my customers more than 12 exposures. They just say it takes too long to shoot, or, or, or it costs too much, or they don't need more than 12 shots. How do you counter that? Hmm? Mr. Fenstermuck. It's easy, Your Honor. 24 exposures, ma'am? 12, please. 24 or 36 is more economical. They are? How does that work? Well, if you break it down by cost per exposure, it turns out that 12 exposures cost nearly twice as much as 36. Great. Well, then I'll... This is still a great way to double or triple our photo processing. When you consider that 90% of the film Eckerd sells comes back to us for processing, we're talking big bucks here. You may still get some resistance. Well, watch this. 36 exposures? No, just give me 12. 36 would be in my camera for years. Do you take a lot of photos of your family? Oh, sure. Have you ever had a really great shot that eh, didn't turn out so well? Yeah. If you took at least two shots of something, you really increase your chances of getting a great picture. That would get pretty expensive, though, wouldn't it? But at Eckerd, you only pay for the pictures you want, so you can shoot to your heart's content. Well, Mr. Harris, what do you say to that? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Your Honor, he's putting words into my mouth. Detective Dixon! Detective Dixon! Surely you know the court will not tolerate such behavior. Your Honor, the prosecution has only one more piece of evidence, but it's a doozy. If I can direct your attention to the monitor one last time. Can I help you with something today? No, thanks. I'm just looking. Hmm. Recognize anyone, Mr. Harris? How can they expect us to memorize all those features and what do you call them on cameras? You don't have to. Here's how one of your colleagues handled it. I used to be intimidated with all the cameras and all the features and benefits of each. But now at the front end selling guide, that helps me and gives me the confidence to sell a camera. It has all of the cameras from the most expensive to the least and all the features and benefits of each one. And um, what I use a lot of times in closing a sale is I'll use the coupon booklet. And in the coupon booklet, the customers can get their first roll free processed. And it has all the coupons for when they get the future rolls developed. It's a total picture package is what you're selling. Sometimes it gets like a madhouse in there. I don't always have the time to spend with every customer. Then why not ask your manager for assistance? See, Mr. Harris, new camera owners represent a real opportunity for Eckerd. They increase their processing volume two to three times above the normal figure. And that increase tends to hold for the first three years after their camera purchase. Okay, Mr. Fenstermacher. 
You want to really know the truth? I just don't want to come off as being perceived as one of those pushy salespeople. Neither does this associate. But this is how she deals with it. You don't need to be pushy to try to sell something. You just need to be friendly and know your product and know what the customer wants in order to give him what he needs. Well, if a customer comes in and they've already got something in mind, for instance, film, you ask them if they need batteries. Lots of times people don't think about the little things. That makes me feel great because I know my sales are going up. I know that customer is getting a good picture. And everybody's happy. Now, how does that make you feel, Mr. Harris? Your Honor, the prosecution rests. Mr. Harris, you may step down and approach the bench. Al Harris, is there anything you wish to say before this court pronounces sentence upon you? I know I messed up, but it won't happen again. Al, people look to Eckerd for four things. Quality, value, selection, and service. Now that's the total picture. We're the leaders in photo processing right now, but we won't increase that lead or even hang on to it unless we are totally committed to offering all four components every time, every day, at every store. And that takes selling, Al. Our product, our services, ourselves. We've selected a jury of your peers to decide your fate. Jury, what say you? Total commitment me. You're doing the right thing. Your smiles, the things you say. A message you convey. Good service and quality. Our daily goes to be. it. Al Harris, starting from today, you are going to be committed. Totally committed. Goodbye and good luck, son. <laughs> wow. I wasn't expecting a production number. I thought that kind of thing only happened in big budget videos. <laughs> you lucked out, Al. Where are you guys taking me now? I mean, what could possibly lie ahead of us from here? Why, photo opportunities, of course. Oh, yeah. There you have it. Quality, value, selection, and service. Delivered by all of us each and every day. That's what's going to keep Eckerd far ahead of the competition. Well, if anyone can do it, we can. There's not a better, smarter, more motivated team in the business today than ours. So long, photocops. And the thanks of a great foundation go with you. Don't make us come after you like we had to do young Al here. By the way, Al, you're free to go. <laughs> but before you do, Al, here's a little something to remember us by. Post a print of my mugshot? Oh, guys, you shouldn't have. Hey. Oh. And there you have it. Another convert to the cause of total commitment. I love a happy ending, don't you, Skip? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, how about a little dinner? Yeah, I'm starved. Let's go. Hey, Skip, what the... What's this? What do you expect from Eckerd? It's a photo finish. Surely, they would dare. Okay, is there anything else you need today? No, thanks. Thanks for shopping at Eckerd. Thank you. Bye. I have some pictures to pick up. What's your last name? Andrews. Okay, let me find them for you.
Here you go. Do you need any film today? No, thanks. Is there anything else I can get you? Nothing. Okay. All right, your total is ten ninety one. Okay. This is Julie from Eckerd. I was trying to reach the Moore residence. Okay, um, someone dropped off some film and I just wanted to let you know that your pictures are ready. Okay, thanks a lot. I need some film for my 35 millimeter camera. What speed do you need? 200. And how many exposures? 24. Okay. Here you go. Is there anything else I can get you? Nothing else. Okay. What you need? I wanted to see if y'all could blow this up for me. Okay, um, we don't do those here, but we can send it away for you to have it done. Hmm. Well, how long will it take? Uh, we usually get those back in about three days. All right, I'll take a five by seven, two eight by tens, and a poster print. Okay, is there anything else you need? No, that'll be it. No, thanks. I'm just looking. Okay. Can I check out here? Sure. Is this going to be all today? That'll do it. Okay. Single-use cameras are hot these days. They're easy to use, affordable and portable. And for processing, you just drop it off, camera and all. People love single-use cameras, and Eckert sells a lot of them. But our customers don't always come back to us for processing the film. So we still lose a sale to those other guys. We want to keep our customers coming back for single-use cameras and for processing the film. To do that, we're going to sell this, the Express Shot 35mm camera, available exclusively at Eckerd Express Photo Centers. Like any single-use camera, the Express Shot comes preloaded with film and batteries. But here's the beauty of it. The Express Shot is designed so it can be reloaded by an Express Lab associate. So it's reusable and... If I bring this back to you for processing, you'll reload it with fresh film and batteries for free? That's right, for as long as you own the camera. And as long as you bring it into any Eckerd Express Photo Center for one hour processing. Free film and batteries forever? And for only $9.99, the Express Shot costs less than most single-use cameras. Wow, sounds like it's worth a shot. I'll try it. When she returns the Express Shot for processing, she simply hands it to an Express Lab associate, just like dropping off any single-use camera. To process film from the Express Shot, first check the film counter on the camera to see if open is showing. If it isn't, push the shutter and wind the film as you normally would, using up the film until open is showing. To open the Express Shot and remove the film for processing, use this special key. You might say it's the key to the success of this promotion, 
because it makes the express shot reusable and reloadable. To reload the express shot, insert a fresh roll of film. Line up the film leader and mark. Close the door. Press the shutter button once and use the key to wind the film until the counter shows 24 exposures. Remember, when reloading the express shot, use only 24 exposure, 400 speed ASA ISO 35 millimeter film. And for batteries, use the ones from processed single-use cameras. If your customer is waiting for prints, just hand her the reloaded express shot. Or if she's returning for her prints, just place the reloaded express shot in the Express Print 60 processing envelope, ready for pickup. Now, if a customer uses our System 2 or Ultralab 35 services for her express shot, the film is processed the same as any other single-use camera, and the express shot is thrown away. The express shot will not be returned with next day processing, only with Express Print 60 one-hour processing. So be sure to sell your customer on the advantages of Express Print 60, deluxe four-inch prints in just one hour, as you tell her about the Express Shot. The Express Shot is so simple, it's brilliant, and it's a great deal for everybody. Great for our sales, because the customer will return to us for processing her film. It's great for the environment, because the batteries reloaded into the Express Shot come from processed single-use cameras. There's no waste. This is a great deal. I get free film batteries reloaded on my camera every time I bring in my Express Shot camera for one hour processing. You can even save on processing by presenting your Express Print 60 coupons every time you drop off your camera. That is a great deal. And you'll pay for your Express Shot camera just one time, for as long as you own the camera. And as long as you bring it into Eckerd Express Photo Center for one hour processing. That's better than buying a new single use camera every time. And the Express Shot costs less. Only $9.99 and I pay for it one time. All you have to do is keep coming back. Thanks, I will. That's the idea, to keep customers coming back and keep photo processing sales going up. That's why the Express Shot camera is such a hot shot. So smile and say, Express Shot. From what I've seen on the show floor, the advanced photo system is really a, a breakthrough in photography. It's really a photo product that's unique and uh, quite a bit different than what we've experienced in the past because it allows the customer to interact with the picture taking and even the picture making. For Eckerd, it's, it's going to be a real important growth vehicle this year because we're already known uh, for our photo finishing and for our expertise and for our leadership in, that, in the photography field. So, Having the cameras in our locations and having our, our associates being able to describe the features and benefits of those cameras is really going to be important, I think, in, as we go forward with the advanced photo system. The two most important things I would like to tell them is to be friendly with the customer and there will be a lot of people that will have a lot of misinformation, but to try to be able, friendly and to answer their questions and to think in terms of keeping the feature and benefit description of the product simple. This training program is part of that process. This introductory video, we're trying to get the word out to all of our associates how important this launch really is to Eckerts. And, and we want to help the customer you know, achieve what they're interested in, and that's better pictures.
Photography is an essential part of our society. It is a part of everyday life. We use it to tell stories, to prove or disprove facts, and most importantly, to capture our most cherished personal memories. George Eastman's 1885 introduction of roll film changed the world forever. Now Kodak is ready to do it again. Kodak found a way to create a magnetic layer so thin that light passes right through it. The result is the marriage of conventional photography and the digital age. Imagine a technology so advanced that high quality picture taking becomes second nature. You don't even think about the camera, you just concentrate on the moment. All accomplished by cameras, film, and photo finishing equipment talking to each other using digital information recorded on each frame of the negative. In the next few minutes you will find out how the Kodak advanced photo system will change photography forever. You will also learn critical information, information that your customers will be asking you about this system. What's so special about the advanced photo system? First, it is a system consisting of new intelligent cameras, film, and photo finishing. Advantix film is designed to take advantage of the unique capabilities of the advanced photo system. For this reason, other sizes of film won't work in these cameras. Kodak is the industry leader in this drive to improve the picture-taking experiences of millions of people. In its quest to improve consumer photography, Kodak conducted some of the most sophisticated, thorough market research ever. 20,000 customers around the world responded with the features they would like to see in cameras, film, and photo finishing. The advanced photo system was designed from the ground up with the needs of the consumer in mind. This is the heart of the system, the leaderless Advantix film cassette. Advantix is Kodak's most advanced film technology. Advantix film is unlike anything you have sold before because the film contains an invisible magnetic layer. To prevent damage to the magnetic information inside, the film is sold and returned to the consumer in the original cassette, which means you'll never see or handle the film again. You just drop the leaderless cassette into any advanced photo system camera, close the door, and the camera handles loading for you. Film loading is a significant problem for many consumers, so be sure to mention this drop-in load feature. Now, you may be wondering how anyone can tell the difference between an unexposed roll of film and an exposed roll. After all, there is no leader, and negatives are returned in the cassette. The pictures on the side of the cassette tell you everything about the film inside. If a customer asks you questions about these pictures, you need to be ready with the answers. Advantix film is either unexposed, partially exposed, exposed but unprocessed, or processed with the negatives in the cassette. Once a roll has been fully exposed, it cannot be reinserted into the camera. This feature eliminates double exposures. Advantix film comes in 15, 25, or 40 exposure lengths, and 100, 200, and 400 speeds for bright light, general purpose, and low light or action shots. But the cassette is only part of the total system. Advanced photo system cameras give your customers new composition controls never before available even in professional cameras. A three position switch allows unique composition control over each individual picture on the roll. In C or classic mode, pictures will be similar in width and height to 35 millimeter. H or group mode provides a wider picture. Finally, P or panoramic view is ideal for large groups or scenic shots. Users can change modes on the fly, picture by picture, giving them the composition control they have always wanted. Some cameras make use of the Advantix magnetic layer to significantly improve picture quality. Images that were once considered marginal or unacceptable can now be improved. 
The result is more acceptable quality images per roll. IX, or information exchange cameras, record information about the lighting conditions at the time of exposure. Problems such as backlighting or artificial lighting are recorded by the camera right on the film. This picture quality improvement feature allows the photo finisher's equipment to automatically compensate for many lighting problems. Let's go over the cameras that make use of this feature. The Advantix 4100 IX zoom camera is one of the smallest zoom lens cameras on the market. It provides picture quality improvement, an LCD indicator, and close focus to two feet. The Advantix 3600 and 3700 IX cameras provide many of the features of the 4100 using a fixed lens, red eye reduction, a 200 zone autofocus, and picture quality improvement are packed into a small, convenient, easy to use camera. For the cost conscious, there are Advantix cameras that deliver the composition control, size, and ease of use without the information exchange and picture quality improvement features. The Advantix 3200 AF provides flip-up flash for superior red eye reduction and a two-zone autofocus to two and a half feet. The Advantix 2000 Auto provides entry-level access to the drop-in load and composition control features of the advanced photo system. This model includes an inline flash with red eye reduction, a self-timer, and close focus up to three and a half feet. These cameras are just the beginning of a revolution in consumer photography. Some advanced photo system cameras will provide the ability to place a scene title on each print. And some advanced photo system cameras will allow you to remove a roll that is partially shot. Later, you can reinsert that roll and resume shooting right where you left off. Where do you see the results of digital features such as information exchange in the photo finishing package? When consumers get their processed pictures back, the negatives are returned in the cassette, protecting the digital information inside. And here is a feature many customers have never seen before. An index print. All of the pictures on the roll assembled on a single print. Each cassette has a unique number to identify the roll. All prints, including the index print, are stamped with this ID number, assuring the cassette is matched with the prints. When a customer wants a reprint, they simply hand you the Advantix film cassette and specify the picture number. This can be the number on the index print or on the back of their existing print. As you can see, the advanced photo system is designed to make reprints and enlargements much easier. Think about it. No negatives, just a cassette and a number. This is the level of convenience that consumers asked for. When you compose a picture with an advanced photo system camera, the C, H, and P modes result in three different print sizes. The matching index print gives you another way to see which mode was selected. H, or group mode, uses the entire negative. Classic and panoramic modes use a portion of the negative. The box on the index print shows which part of the negative will be printed. So what happens if your customer wants a classic mode shot to be reprinted in panoramic mode? Any certified photo finisher can handle this change with ease. The system was designed to give consumers greater control over composition when the picture was taken and to make composition changes in reprinting. Just remember that Advantix film can only be processed by labs who have this certification indicating they have the necessary equipment to produce the Advantix photo finishing package. When consumers were presented with all the features of the advanced photo system, nine out of 10 said they would replace their current camera with an advanced photo system camera. Why? Because the unique combination of magnetic, digital information, and conventional photography has solved some age old photographic problems. Have you ever had a customer who experienced problems loading film? What about double exposures, unexposed frames, or fogged film? What about difficulties in composing a shot, such as a large group of people or a scenic view? Your customers want high quality images every time. 
They want easy to use, intelligent cameras, simple film loading, and prints that look like what they composed in the viewfinder. The advanced photo system solves these problems and more. The power of photography and the digital age, together, the possibilities are amazing. When you think of the advanced photo system, think Kodak. Good morning. I'm Mona Furlot, Vice President of Photo Operations. And with me today is Jim Sidman, our Senior Director of Employee Relations and Employee Relations Council. Good morning. Today we are going to discuss a very timely and important aspect of photo finishing. How to identify and handle child abuse and sexually explicit material. Now before we begin, I want to tell you what we are not here to discuss. We are not here to establish a corporate moral compass for our associates or to provide a company definition of obscenity. I'm sure that each person has their own opinion on what represents obscenity based on their personal values and background. In fact, even a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States said many years ago, I don't know the definition of obscenity, but I'll know it when I see it. That's a compelling statement that still rings true today. But as providers of photo development services, our job is to deliver quality photo processing without first deciding if we should print the material because it does not meet our personal belief or what is acceptable or morally correct. Remember that our job is not to be a censor or good taste and morally acceptable standards. Jim, why don't you discuss some of the legal principles that apply to obscenity? Thank you, Mona. Mona is definitely right when she states that we must not place our personal or corporate values on what we will agree to print. But there are certainly some federal and state laws that provide us with guidelines that we must follow when we come across what is considered by the law as obscene. For something to be considered obscene, it must fail a three-part legal test first described in the Supreme Court case of Miller v. California. To be considered obscene, the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the purient interest. The work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law, and the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. The first part of what is known as the Miller test, applying contemporary community standards, is the most important, as well as the most difficult to determine. Contemporary community standards are those standards established by what is generally accepted in the community as a whole. A good method to assess community standards is to follow the, quote, newsstand criteria, end of quote. The newsstand criteria simply means that if a similar subject matter is available in a publication on a newsstand in a community, the materials are probably not obscene and can be processed and returned to the customer. For instance, let's say you receive material with a naked man and woman in a non-obscene or better stated non-sexually explicit embrace. For example, standing side by side with their arms around each other's waist. That is okay. Another acceptable example is where two nude persons are in a picture but are not in a sexually explicit act or embrace. These depictions may also be seen in advertisements by well-known designers in commonly sold magazines. 
These pictures, although of two nude persons, would meet the newsstand criteria and would be okay to print. Now, on the other hand, if you have a negative of two nude persons embracing in a sexually explicit manner, that would not meet the newsstand criteria, since that is not the type of depiction that is seen in a magazine on a newsstand. An embrace that is considered sexually explicit is two nude persons whose genitalia are touching. Now, the analysis does not end here. We must also consider whether, in spite of the sexually explicit depiction, there is a literary scientific, artistic, or political justification for the depiction. The way you determine this is to know the purpose of the depiction from the person who submits the photo finishing for processing. Unless you know or have reason to believe that the person's explanation for the sexually explicit material is legitimate, we should decide on the side of caution and not print it. If we do know the material is for one of these appropriate reasons, then we should print it in spite of what appears to be sexually explicit material. For example, say that a medical doctor in the field of sexual dysfunction comes in with pictures portraying sexually oriented pictures for his practice. Now that would be okay to print. You should also print what would otherwise be sexually explicit material if it is requested by law enforcement. Situations such as these will occur, if at all, very, very infrequently. Mona, why don't you discuss our procedures with respect to the handling of sexually explicit material? Okay, Jim, thanks. There are three situations where we need to pay particular attention to how we handle potentially sexually explicit material. Remember that the three types of situations are sexually explicit material of adults, sexually explicit material of minors and child abuse. When you print film containing adult subject matter, you should first consider the material based on the three-part test that Jim referenced. Determine whether what you are looking at is also generally seen in magazines found in the community. If they are, then print the work as normal. If you, as an Express Photo Lab Manager, believe the material is sexually explicit, don't print it. If you are uncertain if the content is sexually explicit, then partner with your store management. The two of you should then decide if the pictures meet the new stand criteria of the community standard test. If you decide that it satisfies the community standard test, then print the work as normal. If it doesn't meet the standard, these steps need to be taken. The negatives and all digital media without prints should be returned to the customer with a Code 10 letter. If already printed, the prints should be immediately shredded. Prints all non-sexually explicit prints. Return all negatives and digital media to the customer. Do not return index print on full or partial rolls with sexually explicit prints non-sexually explicit prints should be printed and returned to the customer with a Code 10 letter. We must always be mindful that we are a retail business with the primary purpose of offering great customer service. For this reason, we must be absolutely certain to give the benefit of the doubt to the customer and make sure that the material is outside the scope of what is generally available in the community. By the way, some of you may not know what a Code 10 letter is. A Code 10 letter is a form letter that is issued to a customer explaining that we didn't print the film because of the nature of the material. You can find this letter when it is needed on the photo website. The next situation that I want to cover involves unacceptable sexual contact involving minors. Keep in mind that minors are considered under the age of 18. Understand also that we are more aggressive when it involves minors. It is Eckert's policy to report all incidences of child pornography. Minors engage in sexual behavior and child abuse. For the purpose of determining child pornography, 
This may include any depiction of a nude child. So make sure you consult with store management. For any photo depicting a minor alone with other minors or with adults, immediately alert store management. Management will notify the front end photo supervisor or the district manager to inform them that they have a material, this material, and intend to act on it. Management should then notify local law enforcement and retain the suspect photos and negatives. Management should request a signed statement showing receipt by law enforcement authorities before releasing suspect photos and negatives. A security report must be prepared. The sign release must be attached to the security report. The security report and release must be sent to Photo Operations, Incorporate. Follow instructions given by the local law enforcement. And finally, the distribution or communication of this material to any other than store management or law enforcement is strictly forbidden. Store management should address any customer inquiring regarding this material. Management should follow the advice of law enforcement on how to respond to the customer's questions regarding the film. If no advice is provided by law enforcement, then tell the customer that the material has been turned over to the local law enforcement authorities. There are a few more important points on this subject of processing unacceptable images of minors. First, when it is unclear about the age of the person in this picture, treat it as though the person is a minor. Second, if the material is not clearly sexually explicit, management should consider whether it depicts or displays activities that may lead to sexual activity involving minors. Third, if it involves child abuse, even if not sexual in nature, it should be reported to local law enforcement. Keep in mind, this is a highly confidential material. Mistakenly accusing a customer of a criminal offense can cause legal exposure to the company. We must be very, very careful in our decision-making process. We also must be very careful with whom we share the information and how we communicate the information to others. The only personnel within Eckerd Corporation that should ever know of a situation involving photo finishing, involving sexual content, or child abuse is the associate who first had contact with the material, the store management, and the district management staff. Absolutely no other associate should be made aware of, be allowed to see, or have knowledge of the material. This is a terminable offense for any associate who fails to follow this important rule. Although this does not pertain to sexually explicit material, it may also be appropriate to address two other photo finishing situations that occasionally arise. Pictures portraying weapons and those displaying drugs come up from time to time. In each of these situations, we should follow the same decision path and get store management and district management as partners before a decision is made whether to contact the law enforcement authorities. A good rule of thumb is to disregard small quantities of what appears to be drugs or individuals using drugs, but to report a picture showing substantial quantities of what appears to be drugs. Similarly, do not report pictures of weapons unless what the picture shows is an arsenal of weapons or illegal weapons such as machine guns, rocket launchers, or hand grenades. Good comments, Jim. Well, this covers the important points regarding the handling of unacceptable, sexually explicit material child pornography, child abuse, and other situation in Eckerd Photo Labs. This area has been and continues to be a subject that requires constant attention. Hopefully, with these guidelines, you and the management team will be more equipped to effectively address these issues. Remember that you can also find these guidelines, as well as a Code 10 letter that we referenced online at the photo web page. Now, does anyone have any questions? The phone lines are open, so go ahead and please call us at 1-800-363-7990, or you can fax them to 
4721. While we're waiting for these calls, I have a few questions that have come up while we've been visiting labs or during our training courses that maybe Jim and I could maybe clear up for you. Here's a question that I've got just the other day. A friend of mine brought in a roll of film for processing. Her pictures were just regular photos. I guess that means non-explicit photos. Why can't I show them to a friend who works in the pharmacy department? Well, that's a very good question that needs uh, addressing, and the answer is very simple. Those photos, the prints and the negatives, belong to the customer. They do not belong to Eckerd Corporation, and it is not within our right to share that with anyone else in the store, whether or not they're sexually explicit. And that includes making copies of prints. Absolutely. The distribution of prints or making duplicates has come up in our labs before, so we want to make sure that the associates know they cannot do that. Mona, here's one that's also come up that I'll address to you. Are pictures of naked children considered child pornography? Well, hopefully we just review that but you know one of the things that I like to tell the people in the labs and district management is, is you know get a partner preferably what you might want to do is get somebody that is a parent that understands that because there are situations when you're going to have infants or or younger children one or two years old in a, in a bubble bath and that's fine you may have situations where you have a nine-year-old or ten-year-old that may have just uh, thought it was a cute shot or whatever but one of the things you need to remember is that might have been you as a parent taking the photo. However, in the photo lab, we don't know who's taking the photo. We know that as a parent, you probably don't want the babysitter taking a photo of your 10-year-old naked. So that's why I believe we have to err to the side of making sure we're cautious. Absolutely correct. And again, as we pointed out, there's no what we call bright line test where, yes, it's child pornography and do it, and no, it's not. I think you have to use good judgment but certainly where there's a, a depiction of a child naked, where there's an adult, adult in the picture doing something unusual or suspicious, that would justify maybe uh, erring on the side of caution and contacting the police, where a, a, a very small child or infant in the bathtub uh, alone might not be. But again, it's critical that you use your best judgment, and if you don't know, or if you have some suspicion, take a partner. That's the critical thing, take a partner. Okay, great. Um, I have another question uh, that was brought up during our EBN. Uh, you talked about, what about the magazines that come shrink-wrapped? Are they available on newsstands? What does that, can you clear that up for us Absolutely. in a, a non-lawyer terminology? I'll do my best. Okay. That's not very easy, though. Uh, but the newsstand criteria really speaks to magazines that are available to anyone on a counter. When a magazine comes shrink-wrapped, it's intended to be protected against minors because no one that's a minor is going to be able to purchase that magazine because there are restrictions to who can purchase something that's shrink-wrapped. So no, uh, magazines such as Penthouse or Hustler that you can get in a, in a store in a community but his shrink wrap would not be considered available under the newsstand criteria. But magazines like Cosmopolitan um, or other, uh, some of these health magazines clearly have depictions of uh, scantily dressed or even nude individuals uh, are available and would be representative of what meets the newsstand criteria. Okay, good. I think we had one more, well actually we have a couple more questions that were brought up. Uh, when people of management cannot make a decision regarding the photo, what's the next step? Well, if people in management are unable to make a decision, then they need to take it to district management. Okay. Obviously, it's, you, need to, you need to take a partner. And it's just critical that if two people can't make that decision, then go to a third person. Um, obviously, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. And as, and as Mona said, it's, it's important that we understand and balance excellent customer service and providing the, the, uh, the wants and needs of our customers with our legal obligation to make sure that in particular child pornography is not permitted to be distributed. So when it comes to, when it comes to adult uh, sexually explicit material, obviously we have a little bit more leeway and we should be erring on the side of the customer. But when it comes to child pornography, we should be erring on the side of turning it into the police. Exactly. 
And many times district managers and FEPSs have been able to call up here to corporate and they continue, can continue to do that. And actually, I think we have a fax coming in right now. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's hope I can read this. When you apply the newsstand and community test to material, what consideration should be given to publications like Playboy and Hustler, etc.? This was not fixed. It really just did come in. Um, Larry Flint was clearly of obscenity charges, was cleared of obscenity charges. Jeff, I thought for a second this was coming from Larry Flint. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I think we've answered that. And the fact is, Hustler and, and uh, Penthouse, those things that come shrink-wrapped do not meet the newsstand criteria because they cannot be purchased by a minor. So you have that, that check and balance, um, even though it might be available in a store somewhere, it's not available to a minor and therefore would not meet that standard. And I, I want to make sure that everyone knows that the Code 10 definition is, is, a, is a corporate uh, policy. We are more concerned about the child pornography and making sure that we do not distribute child pornography. So as we talked about before, we're trying to give you guidelines of what Eckerd's is saying that we will not print. And the customer, remember, receives their negatives back. Did we have a call there? No, but we do have one more question that needs to be addressed here, Mona, and that is, how do I explain to the customer that I cannot print his, his or her pictures due to obscenity? You know, we really don't want our lab managers or associates to have a lot of uh, issues and confrontations with the customer. That's why we came up with the Code 10 letter, and I believe if you'd like, I could just read one part of the paragraph of the Code 10 letter. It says, our company's photo processing policy prevents our labs from pr pr printing negatives which are defined as unsuitable. You probably won't have that many people giving you a hard time. So if you just put the letter in the envelope, the customer receives their negatives back and has that letter. Okay, I have a call. Denise from Pensacola, can I yes. help you? Yes. Um, we've I had stuff. We've had stuff come through Qualex, through mm -hmm. the Outlab, mm -hmm. um, that was apparently not reviewed. Okay. Um, and we were told that because it was processed in a certain area where those laws didn't apply, that they could do that. Okay. Do you want me to take that, Jim? Sure, yeah. Uh, I've worked with Qualex uh, uh, management on this whole EBN, and basically they have a policy that is very similar to ours, but we need to remember wh what happens with Qualix is they do not inspect their work. Uh, they actually do production of 20 to 30,000 orders a night. So they have a policy that they will, if they can find the child pornography, that they will uh, obviously call the police. But there are times when they won't. And in their policy, it says there will be times when, because the quantity of work, they won't be able to catch everything. So they have not had any issues with that. I did speak to the, uh, the attorneys from Qualex, and I, I think that's, uh, is that answering your question? I... Remember, they don't inspect the work like we do, so they do a good job at trying to. So are we just supposed to let it go? We're supposed to let it go, yes. I mean, we, it is their accountability is basically what I'm saying. It is not our accountability. If they print child pornography, we're not to inspect their work. It will be their accountability, not efforts. Does that, does that help you? Yes. Okay. Okay, I just want to make one observation before we go to our next call. There are some people who are trying to fax in their numbers on our phone number. So let me give you our fax number again and our phone number. The fax number is 727-395-4721. The phone number is 1-800-363-7990. And we have a call from Ryan in New York. Yes. Go ahead, Ryan. Hello. Uh, my question is actually, if there is a false accusation against a customer's order, what happens to the employee, the customer, and the district staff and the company as far as liability goes? If there's a false accusation, uh, again, it, we're really in most cases going to be dealing with a situation of child, uh, uh, child abuse and or uh, child pornography. And in those situations, if we take the position that it was, it was difficult to determine whether that person was or was not a minor, in most cases we're going to prevail because the law 
it, the state law puts an onus or a burden on the retailer to notify police of anything that captures or depicts child pornography or child abuse. That's similarly true of a graphic uh, sexual activity, even of adults. So if it's very graphic as an adult, um, and ultimately the state doesn't prosecute it, we're still going to be protected. And similarly, if it's a child, and there's an example that Mona can give real life recently, where there was we printed uh, some pictures of a what appeared to be someone in her mid-20s. It turned out the child was 14. The fact of the matter is there's no way that Eckerd or our associates or management who make the call can determine a person's age from a print. So you have to use your best judgment. And that kind of goes to where Mona said before, if you don't have children yourself of, of teenage age, then maybe you need to talk to someone who does so maybe they can give you some guidance. But the real critical issue here is you have to use your best judgment. And if, if the person who's being captured by that picture looks like a minor, if you have any doubt that the child looks like a minor, and that is 18 or under, then you should notify the police. Mona, do you have anything to add to that? I just have a concern about, the question is what will happen to the store management and the district management, is that if, if there's, I, I guess I'm not clear on what the question is. I, I think if, if, if it's determined by, by the law enforcement, if the pictures are not of an explicit nature or, or the individual involved, uh, the pictures are not, are determined not explicit, can the customer then turn around and press charges against the store, the associates, or anybody? Well, let me make this observation. You know, when it comes to adult sexual explicit, we're not, ta we're not contacting the police. Right. All we're doing is giving them a Code 10 letter and telling them we're not going to print the material. So we're not going to be in any legal uh, difficulty with, when it comes to sexually explicit material of adults. But as it pertains to to minors, when we do notify the police, I'm fairly certain that we're protected, and so too would our associates uh, who take the stance that it is child pornography. I think that's the benefit of getting the, uh, the partner. The sexually explicit photos of adults, we do not call the police. It is just our policy that we aren't going to print them. We really usually have no recourse on that from customers. When we call the police for child pornography, they're, you know, get, get a partner. And I've never had a case come up where it came back that the store or the district manager did the wrong thing. And we would support you there. Is that is that answering your question? Yes, that answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Bye-bye. Um, I have a question here. I think we, we might have answered it. But um, it says, what happens when you have pictures of drugs and pipes on a bed? I guess that says pot and crack. Do we need to report it? I think we touched on that before. You may want to touch on it more clearly. I, I will elaborate somewhat. And, and again, using your best judgment, if it's someone who you think is smoking crack or pot from a pipe and it's an individual, no. I don't think it's our obligation to notify the police about that. By the same token, if you see a whole array of paraphernalia, and, or, or several people, by example, who are um, uh, cutting up cocaine and putting them in bags or pot and putting it in bags and they happen to have a picture of that, that's a different story. So if it's an individual or a couple of people smoking, no. But on the other hand, if it's a whole arsenal of, of uh, weapons or a whole array of, of drugs, then yes, you notify the police. Did I answer? Hopefully I answered your question. And that was a fax, so we won't hear back from That's them unless right. they refax us. Um, I have another fax here to follow up with the Qualix issue. Number one, are we, I guess it says capable, what is that? Culpable. Culpable. As the seller, I'm not good at reading these things, the seller, distributor of questionable photos. I think that I answered that, did I not? If we run across a questionable group of Qualix photos when making spec 5x7s, what is the disposition? I think at that point in time, if you, well, hopefully, if you're making spec 5x7s of Qualix orders, I hope that means you've done 100% of the spec 5x7s of the express photo orders. So um, to the question of that, then the, the same thing would apply. But I would also want to get Qualix as a partner. We've had a situation very similar to this happen about a month ago, and we contacted the vice president of Qualex, and they are as partners to, uh, talking to 
each other regarding that. Get an answer to this again, so we're real clear on that. On the, the question again is, are we culpable as sellers or distributors of the questionable photos if it comes through the Qualex lab? And I would say no. Okay. Is that... I agree with that. Okay. I, in fact, in that situation, Qualex, as far as we're concerned, would have to, what is known as indemnify Eckerd for having uh, produced those uh, pictures, and all we did was distribute them and we don't have an obligation to check photos before we hand them out. Right. So we would not be in the distribution line in that sense where we'd be legally culpable. Right. I, I think that answers. There are issues with Qualex because previously Eckerd owned their own plants and we actually inspected all of our work and all the code tans and child pornography were handled at, through that plant. Now as Qualex owning our photo finishing plants, their policies actually differ from when we owned our own plants. I think we have another fax coming, and we'll be waiting for that. Let me see while we're waiting on this fax if we've gone through all of these. Actually, here it comes. If you could just give me one second. I really should have worn my glasses. That would have helped a lot, so I'm going to let you do that. Okay. Uh, I'll see what I can do. A true lab situation. Okay. A customer dropped off a roll of film. Women on roll were topless. They all looked of age. So far, so good. Associate was working in the lab, knew one of the women in the picture, and knew she was 16 or 17. Aha. Is this a confidentiality issue? She looked old enough, but only because someone in the lab knew of her age, the picture was not printed. Well, uh, I think that's an excellent job of the person who was in the lab and made the decision not to print it, because whether or not the person looks of age in the picture is, is sort of trumped by the fact that the person knew who it was and was a minor. So that, that associate did the right thing. If you know the individual who is coming in and, or whose picture is being captured on print and you know that that person is underage, then that is, what, that is the information you use as the basis of determining whether or not you print something. You don't simply go by what's on the picture because you already know who the individual is. So the, the particular associate in the lab made the right call on this occasion. Exactly. Remember, we can't distribute child pornography. So whether you know the age or not know that, well, this one actually was helpful because she didn't know it. Knowingly doing that, we, we would be distributing child pornography. Do we have any more faxes or... I think we're all good to go. Uh, I think so. Well, we certainly thank you very much for your time and attention and some of these uh, excellent questions that you've asked. And again, if, if these issues come up, take a partner. And as Mona said, that if there's any, any doubt, you need to call into the corporate office and photo operations to get further guidance. Thank you, Jim. And I just want to tell you one more thing, because I always want to have the last word, is this, these, uh, this whole session will be videotaped and will be used as a training tool for all new associates. We now have what we call our Wendy Ellison tape that we use for all new associates. We will be distributing these, after we review them, we'll be distributing these and this tape will have to be shown to all new associates so we make sure everything's clear to a new associate coming in. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Have a nice weekend.